Well, you have the text on the back of the song sheet, and everybody has strange weeks. I had a strange week. Um, there's one thing I wanted to uh, announce before I get going. We are doing something different on Wednesday night, and uh, it, it, was, it was actually with some real struggle. I, I'm going to start, Lord willing, on Wednesday night, a series on the person of Satan. I got to tell you, I hate what I have to go through when I preach on the person of Satan. I have done it for many years. With, I've not done it for many years without first taking time to, to pray and fast. I have never, to my living memory, spoken and exposed the person of Satan that I haven't had things go terribly wrong in, around my situation and or people that I love. And and that had happened again this week. And, and I, I just... I praise the Lord. I would rather have the devil as my adversary than my friend. But it's, it's, one of the, uh, it's one of the deeper studies, and I find it to be so thrilling to the Christian to have their enemy exposed is to find a victory that you didn't know was waiting there for you. So uh, we're doing some things different on Wednesday night. Uh, I'm leading it. We, we start right on time, and we go an hour, and we stop. We have our prayer time first, and then we, we do the lesson after that. But I know that kids are, are coming, and uh, they got to get to bed for school. But if you just want to pick me up in the middle of the week, it sounds terrible to preach on Satan, but it is exciting. I have never done so. In fact, it's along the lines of one of the courses in the seminary that I'll be speaking on, one of the 300 courses. And I have found it to be, from different people, just liberating to to have their enemy exposed having said that let's have a word of prayer father would you open up the word of god to us now and would you especially bless for jesus name's sake the minister lord god who seeks to be used of you lord don't let his humanity get in the way but lord use the humanity lord to communicate oh jesus your love for us in jesus name Amen. This is an incredible account. This is one of those accounts that people just, when they're flipping through their Bibles and they get the book of Zechariah, it's one of those books that they, you know, maybe I'll just find something else. I just want to find something to refresh myself. It's a very deep book. It's like the book of Revelation. A lot of visions, a lot of symbolism, and it's one of those you've got to really just be still and study and think upon, and before us is a vision, however, that as dark as it is at the beginning, it is so encouraging. The time of this prophecy, Zechariah, along with his contemporary, the prophet Haggai, were, had just come to the people. The Lord had sent them there because they were at a great low. Jim preached just a little bit ago upon how they laid the foundations of the temple. They were in captivity for so many decades, and now God had sent back the Jews with a command to build the temple. And they laid the foundation, and there was a great shout. The old people wept who saw the former glory, and the young shouted for joy, and there was a great noise, and it was heard afar off, it says, including their enemies. Their enemies heard it. And they came, and by force of arms, they stopped them from building the temple. And time had not only come to a standstill on obeying the command to build the temple, but their hearts had begun to get dull to it. In fact, we read of that time period, the Lord of hosts saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, is it time for you to, yourself to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. The people had begun to grow cold and comfortable with not doing what they had been sent to do. They were confronted with their failure before God, with their coldness of heart. And then through Haggai and Zechariah, the Lord brought encouraging words, encouragement to them. I am with you. And the people were stirred up. God is with us. This, this little tiny remnant that he's rescued and brought us back and we're surrounded by He God is with us. They were stirred up. And through the preaching of Zechariah and Haggai, who, who preached at the same time, prophesied at the same time, we read, so the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the, through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu, 
and they built and finished it according to the command of the God of Israel. And before us now, you have the count there, is one of the visions that God gave Zechariah, which he gave to the people, which encouraged them. May the Lord open up to us this morning. And in spite of any shameful failure that we might have gone through or be going through right now, may we sense the encouragement that God has here. I'm going to read the entire account, and we're going to focus mostly on verses 1 through 5, the entire chapter there. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head. And they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those, among these who stand here. Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you, you and your companions who sit before you, for you are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am sending forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. I can't help it. I, I'm having a hard time just settling down. i got to pray one more time. Oh, Lord, just already the vision has gripped me. Would you unlock it, Lord, before our ears just now? In Jesus' name, amen. There is great encouragement in this vision, but this vision opens with a terrible dark scene. It opens up with fearful judgment standing before God himself with guilt with favor, I mean, with failure and with sin, clothed in garments, iniquity. And Satan, the accuser, is standing up against Joshua, the high priest, before the Lord, and he's spewing against him his accusations. And worst of all, they are true. There is no question as to the guilt he bears. Joshua is covered with filthy garments. Woe and dread is the opening scene of this vision. The angel of the Lord, who is this but the almighty Lord God himself, the Lord Jesus. And if you have the New King James, which I've, I've given you here, they, they capitalize it that you might know it's a reference to God. The angel who is himself, Jehovah. It is he who is both with God and who is God. Indeed, it's the word who was with God and was God and later became flesh. This is that angel of the Lord who said, I am to Moses. The angel of the Lord who spoke as Jehovah in the burning bush and other accounts in the word of God. And he sees in this vision the angel of the Lord and Satan at the right hand of Joshua clothed in filthy garments spewing the sin and the filth and the undeserved place that this man is standing and how God needs to do something about this. It is a dreadful picture. Terrible is the opening of the vision. Joshua stands covered in iniquity that he can't deny. And the accuser of the brother, brother our ancient foe, he is speaking truth, but never as it was intended. He is never so terrible as when he's quoting from the word of God. He's never so, so horrible and hard to be around when it's the law of God that he aims against us. It is a terrible opening scene. How could there be encouragement in this vision? Our iniquity, our sins are exposed. We're powerless to defend ourselves and the accusations of the enemy. They strike our conscience with a stinging accuracy 
And we just know it's reasonable that the favor of God should be withdrawn from us. Indeed, our sins are ever before us. So much so that it would have been a terrible scene even if our enemy wasn't there present to accuse us. Our own conscience testifies the ruinous record before God. Woe to us, as Isaiah said, we are undone in his presence. I've shared before from this pulpit, some of you have heard me tell the story, the dream that Daniel Curry told. He was a preacher of some note many, many years ago, and he dreamed he died, and he went to the gate of heaven, and he said, I'm Daniel Curry, I've come to enter in, and the angel looked in the book of life and said, there is no Daniel Curry here. And what? I'm Daniel Curry, I've preached to thousands, people have been saved through my ministry. Could you look again? And there is no Daniel Curry. But if you wish, you may stand and try to answer for yourself in the presence. Fearing he had nothing to lose, he said in his dream he was ushered into the presence of a room that was so brilliant with light that a man could not long endure it. And from this light came a voice that said, Daniel Curry, have you always obeyed the truth? Have you always, Daniel Curry, been charitable in your opinions of others? Have you always obeyed the word of God? Have you always loved your neighbor? And on and on until Daniel Curry thought that any moment the floor would open up and he would drop into the eternal pit of damnation. And that dreadful scene, that dreadful dream, didn't even have an accuser there. Didn't even have an accusation against him. It was his own conscience alone. It was questions that was asked in the dream. But here we have the accuser of the brethren standing to oppose him. And there he is covered in filthiness and iniquity before the very presence of God. This is a dreadful opening to this vision. Is it not dreadful that Satan should speak the truth only in a manner to destroy us? Highlighting our lives, a spot of sin, a spot of greed, a spot of lust, a spot of pride. Has he not been able to say, was it not for pride that I was kicked out? Is it not true that the judge of all the earth must do right? The law says the horrible opposing and accusations. It is not a matter, though, of Satan giving, which is the hard thing to take, false accusations. If they were, they could not really sting. They couldn't injure. Joshua, though, is clothed in iniquity. And it's not hard for us to leap and to see our own selves there. And the sting is the truth that's sprinkled in all of the accusations. It is then that we've lost our sense of being justified. It is then that we are conscious that in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. Oh, how cruel the devil is. He transforms himself into an angel of light who preaches the word of God. And he takes the word of God and he tries to slice us with it. David Roberts, I believe was the preacher. It's D. Roberts. I found this quote. He was the preacher back in the 1800s. And he wrote about the devil's insidious use of the Bible and the law of God to expose the Christian and his sin. He asked, how can we recognize him then when the Bible does expose sin? How can we know it's the enemy? And he put down three points that reveal the enemy. He said, firstly, thy sins are too great to be forgiven. That's what Satan says. This is his insinuation. Others can be forgiven, but you're peculiar circumstances. You, your knowledge, you, your background, what you should have known, what you could have done, the advantages you had. Your sins are too great to be forgiven. Secondly, thou mayest as well suffer punishment for much as for little. Now that it's hopeless, why do you even try to go on? It's ruined. It's over for you. You've committed the unpardonable sin. There is no hope for you. And thirdly, he uses the scriptures to prove that God is very unrelenting. He convinces people that the accusations that he has to, to bring to them, it comes from a God that is too harsh and too uncaring, too unrelenting to be of any hope to your situation. That 
is the accuser, the brother, no doubt, and more evil than the, the three things he came up with. And know that it is just about any page of our history, maybe even last night, that he can rip out and say, see, here's the proof. You know, you can take a penny and you hold it just right. You can block out the entire sun. And with a mere penny of truth, because he does use truth, that's the sting of it. A penny worth of truth from the word of God, he will confuse one's whole understanding of the gospel of grace. Now, is this not a bleak picture for a vision that was given to encourage the people? How much more can they endure? However, in all the anguish, there is one little thing that I will just throw out right now, and that is, it is better to have him as your adversary than as your friend. I love something Spurgeon said. He said, there is something, however, very comforting in the thought that he is an adversary. I would sooner have him as an adversary than a friend. As an adversary, he is opposing us. What does that mean but that God must be for us? Recall that it was the devil's so-called friendly counsel, loving concern, compassion that had him speak to our first parents when he got them to bite. As he encourages us that we need to become clever for our own good, that we need, we deserve this, or that, that this is now our time. We have to do this. this is, we have to take a stand. It's only right. We have to look out for ourselves until he gets the children of men to bite. And then he says, how could you do that? It is better to have him as an adversary than to hear his sweet talking and be led into sin. Christian, it is better to have him as an adversary for by the same incentive that he has to discourage you forever, one may just be pushed too far for the devil is not omniscient and cause them to flee to Jesus for salvation. The exposing of all your filthy actions may instead cause you to have more compassion on humanity, to love mankind more, to choose to do harm to no one. His merciless manner of accusing you may cause you to flee to Christ, to cause you to desire to have patience rather with all men to overlook the faults of others to become charitable charitable where before pride was your response satan commends his friends though he's actually the friend of no one but he accuses the saints and it can be worse for you to hear him sweet talking you than accusing you because he's seeking to set you up for something more to accuse you of it's a terrible thing to be under the devil's adversarial attacks. But it is worse to be under the spell-binding evil cunning of a so-called friend. Okay, I think the point's been made. This is a dark vision that opens up before Zacharias. But praise God, that's not the whole of it. Praise the Lord, it changes in a moment. The doom and the gloom of the scene before us is broken wide open. I mean, we've all seen Perry Mason, I assume. At least those of you that used to know when TV was black and white, that was before the world had any color in it. And he was like, you know how in a moment Perry Mason objected. In a moment he turned the whole trial around. This was much, there's no comparison. In a moment, the tables are turned and the Lord completely just shatters and as he interrupts Satan in mid-accusations, and he says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? The fiend is found in contempt of court. He is found perverting justice. The very heart of the whole matter of the proceeding which Satan was seeking to pervert for the destruction of Joshua. Satan was held in contempt. He missed the whole meaning the Lord rebuke you, Satan, for he shall not make a mockery out of the proceedings which God has called to order. For understand, the very heart of the whole vision was abused by Satan's accusations. May the Lord give me grace to just express this wonderful truth. It is not Joshua, I mean, is not Joshua there as the high priest? 
Is, is it not the whole idea of priesthood to make atonement? Is it not to put away sin? Satan is abusing the whole situation. He is out of order. The Lord rebuke you. And is Joshua not there to bear the sins, not of himself, but of Jerusalem? That's why he says, the Lord rebuke you, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem. He is clothed in the sins of Jerusalem. He is their representative. He is standing there to put away their sin. The very heart of the whole matter is reconciliation. Reconciliation. That is why he's devised the priesthood, that the filthy clothes might be removed. And is not Jerusalem represented in Joshua a brand that was snatched from the fire, a stick that they used to stir the fire until it's of no more use and it's left to burn? Is, are they not like a brand that has been rescued? Why would God rescue a brand to damn it? Why would he pull it from the fire? Why would he save it to damn it? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. You are out of order. You are out of the whole idea of what God has set up here. You see nothing of the truth that you so foolishly spread around, mixed with your lies. Look at the vision with eyes open by the design of God, which the angel of the Lord is not going to allow Satan to revert, and the picture changes drastically. Joshua is there as a representative of J Jerusalem. They have just been saved like a brand, snatched from the fire of Babylon. It looked like the people were going to be wiped out, but now they've been sent back, and God says, build the temple. We're going to thrive again. Everyone is going to be as in the days of Solomon. Each one will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree is how the prophecy ends. It's a sign in, the, in scripture of great peace and security coming. Joshua was not there to bear his own sin, but the sin of the people. Joshua was there to represent the sin of the whole city that it might be taken away by the design of God. Now, I can't stay any longer on the vision or the Old Testament shadow of the Old Testament priesthood without jumping to the New Testament realities because our true high priest has borne our sin before God and not his own. Hear the scripture anew with this vision as a background. Hear it anew and marvel at it. The Bible says that it, that, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And in verse 21, he says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. You are out of order, Satan. You are held in contempt. The Lord rebuke you. This is Jerusalem whom the Lord has chosen. This is the brand plucked from the fire. Who are you to condemn? John wrote to the saved, my little children. I write these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. And how often, I know preachers, how often we focus on for the whole world. But remember, this was spoken to the Christian, that if he should sin. We so often focus on the part, again, about the whole world. But it's, my little children, I write this to you, that you might know, not just the whole world, but you might know you have an advocate with a father if you should sin. The whole court proceeding was about justifying. It was about reconciliation, not accusing, as Satan tried to turn it. Notice also in verse 4 that it's the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who, it says, takes away the iniquity. I have taken away your iniquity. Now, it is impossible one, impossible for one with knowledge in the New Testament, with understanding of having read and, and, and dwelt upon what is being said in the book of Hebrews to miss the picture of our true high priest. 
Joshua stood there in filthy garments, having taken on the sins of the whole congregation. And when they were removed from him, they were removed from the congregation. Their identity was one. He was representing the whole congregation. And so scripture says that that's what Jesus did. He is our substitutionary sacrifice. He is our representative. He has taken on our sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And when he died to our sin, not only was it judged and taken away for it, but he rose for our justification. And my identity, your identity is in Jesus. Our sins are gone because of our high priest who bore them away. We understand the shadow of the high priest once a year, never without blood, came to make atonement for the people, appearing before God on their behalf for reconciliation, not for accusations. God needs no accusations to know where we are. Can we not discount here the anguish of our Lord as he bore the sins of many, as all the iniquity of the world was laid upon him? The high priest would lay his hands upon the, the sin offering and confess the sins of the people. You know of the scapegoat that took the sin away. You know of the blood that was shed and that made atonement. And it was for the people that the sin had been transferred away from. For when our sin, not his, when our sin was answered for and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was so that we would not be forsaken for our sin. I mean, if he suffered for sin and it wasn't his own, who did he pay for? Who gets the benefit? For he is the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He proves these two things, Paul says, that he's just, sin is taken care of, but that he is the justifier. He's enabled to have mercy on everyone. No, nobody, nobody is going to sneak into heaven through the back door. Quick, come in before the door closes. No one's going to get in that way. We are justified. We go through the front gate with full privilege of Jesus Christ. Co-heirs with him. My representative. Who has believed this report? Is this too good to believe? Isaiah got a glimpse of it in the future and said, who's going to believe this? It's too great. We read, for who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the problem with knowing the scripture so well. You lose your place easy because you keep going by memory. Oh, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. 
Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and, I, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That was so great that Isaiah could only say, Lord, who has believed our report? Did he not cry at the cross? It is finished. Did he not finish it? Notice in verse 4, it is he himself who says, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. Again, Christian, our identity in Christ, in Scripture, is real. He is unashamed to call us brethren. He is our champion. He is our substitutionary sacrifice. He is fully God, so his sacrifice is infinite, able to put away the infinite wrath that God has against sin that will never be reconciled to it. The justice of God, the infinite justice of God is satisfied in infinite sacrifice, but he's true man so that he could take your place and my place there. And he says, take away the filthy garments from him. And he says, I have removed your iniquity and clothed you with rich robes. Now, I know that the devil spews accusations against us. And I know that they sound so valid and seem like a valid use of the court of God's justice. But it is a mockery of everything that God has established the whole idea of the priesthood being there. He was in contempt of, of the proceedings. He was not enforcing them. He is a liar. The enemy is in contempt of court who tries to apply the gospel in a way that contradicts the very design of the priesthood. Atonement. Substitutionary sacrifice. Here again, a new scripture you're so familiar with. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for his all, how shall he not with him freely also give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for your sakes we are killed all day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That was the true court proceeding that was going on, that Satan was rebuked for trying to change it. And back to the vision. It started off dark. But our champion has said, the Lord rebuke you. Is this not Jerusalem who he has chosen? Is this not a brand snatched from the fire? The Lord rebuke you. And Zechariah is watching this vision. And he enters into it. I don't think he could help himself. He's the one that speaks in verse 5. It just bubbles out of him when our Lord Jesus says, take away the filthy garments and he's clothed. In the righteousness of Christ. It just bubbles out of his mouth in verse 5. He says, let them put a clean turban on his head. You know what that symbolized? Oh, that covered the mind. That cleansed the conscience. That was what said holiness to the Lord. Now he's holy to the Lord. Now he's, it was written across on the turban. Now he is able to serve the living God. That was the vision. That was the shadow of the old priesthood. Listen to the reality in the New Testament. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Put a turban on his head, and a turban was set upon him. And he was able to serve in that position. Oh. 
I have to go very quick on this last part. Let me just remind you, if you haven't heard the end of it, of Daniel Curry's dream. Daniel Curry spoke about how he felt that he was undone, that any moment he would be dropping in the eternal pit of hell when he felt a human hand upon his shoulder and said, Father, I have paid for this one's sin. I have put it away by myself. This one is mine. How shall we, who have died to sin, live in it any longer? We can't live in it. But if we sin, if it happens, is it not written to us and not just to the whole world that we have an advocate? Do we not have an adversary who accuses us? Of course we do. But he is making a mockery of the court proceedings. He is making a mockery of everything that Jesus Christ has done. And he is rebuked for it. Verse 6, And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. That seems to be a reference to the angels that he said, clothe him with, right, with rich robes. Do we not have heavenly dwellings? Do we not have our citizenship in heaven? Oh, how can we, how can we indeed live any longer in sin? But if we do, we have an advocate. Verse 8 Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, you and the people you are representing, Joshua. This whole symbol of you standing, this whole vision of you with filthy garments taken away and the filthy garments that were on all Jerusalem are taken away. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold... I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. And I'll add right there, and he'll say, it is finished. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his, his fig tree. Oh. The branch. To be familiar with Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah, he is called elsewhere. Isaiah and Jeremiah, he's called the branch. The Messiah is going to come. It was a live branch that went into the fire for us. That the brand, the smoking brand, could be rescued. Is this not a smoking brand that the Lord has rescued? Do you see the investment that God has in you? Your enemy is a liar, and he is in contempt of court. And the stone that was laid, all recall they had risen up and built the foundation on the foundation, and then he finished the temple through the preaching of Zechariah and the preaching of Haggai. This foundation that was laid has seven eyes. The Lord knows, the Bible says, it's inscripted. The Lord knows those are his. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. No other building can anyone build. We are a living temple built upon the living, sto living stone, built on the one foundation of Christ. This is all revealing Jesus Christ and our certain salvation through substitutionary death, through the blood of the infinite God-man. And through showing that it is our enemy who is in contempt of the whole process, not us. Oh. Did you know that Joshua in Greek is Jesus? Oh, the vision is just so beautiful. In fact, if you have the old King James Bible, people used to be very confused. Ask their pastors when it says in Hebrews chapter 4. If Jesus had given them rest, they would not afterwards have looked. Jesus didn't give us rest. No, that's, that's Joshua, but they didn't translate it that way. They could have. They should have. And now all their translations say, let's, let's clear up that problem. People don't understand that. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus has taken our cloak, our sin, our iniquity, and he has put it away. 
What is Satan telling you? And what is Jesus Christ saying? What is the truth? What is the whole system that God has set up? Is it a gospel of grace? And how can it be something we earn? Is it not beautiful that he says, I have taken away your iniquity? If you have your sheets, let's just do that, that first song. united our praises we offer to thee O great savior glad anthems we raise thy strong arm will guide us our god is beside us to thee our great redeemer forever be praised amen let's just take a moment of silent prayer now this and if there's any anything you have to to bring before the Lord bring it now with faith and with joy Praise you, Lord, that when trials overtake us, escape you will make us. Oh, not only is it your great arm that guides us, but you yourself are beside us. Oh, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. 